Well, good evening, everybody. Lovely to see you all again uh, for this third session as we head through the English Reformations. What we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at what has historically and often still is in textbooks and things being called the Mid-Tudor Crisis. Ten years of really dramatic religious change um, as the pendulum changed from to a more um, from a more from the Henrician Church that we looked at last week, which in its latter years was pretty religiously conservative, um, albeit as we discussed at the end of last week, a kind of Catholicism without the Pope or a Lutheranism without justification by faith, a church in which the king was the supreme head, but the monasteries and religious houses have been dissolved. Uh -huh. Um, the monasteries and religious houses have been dissolved. The Bible was available in English, but the official statements of doctrine, particularly in the 1540s, were conservative, upholding transubstantiation, the slightly ambiguous attitude towards prayer for the dead and purgatory, but mainly aspects of, relig of traditional religion were broadly upheld and worship that was still all taking place in Latin, albeit with the Bible available in English. So Henry dies in 1547 and is succeeded by his son, Edward. Edward VI, who is at the time nine years old, the son of his Henry's third wife, um, Jane Seymour, the, the son for whom all that <laughs> diplomatic and political change in the 1520s and 30s had been aimed at achieving to secure the Tudor succession with a legitimate male heir. And so Edward takes the throne and very, very quickly, um, the religious character of England changes in ways that we will explore in the first half of this evening's session. But Edward only lasted until 1553 and the death of Edward in 1553 was a real surprise. It was a shock. There was nothing to be expected about it. And what happens is there's an attempt at a Protestant coup to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne, the nine days queen. But then Mary, um, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, that first child of Henry VIII, had um, accedes to the throne and reverses all the Protestant religious change of the last, by now, 25 years in pretty short order. And the thing that we tend to know about Mary's church is that it was a persecuting church. And that has very much coloured the way the historiography has been written, particularly by later generations of English um, historians and English Protestant historians. And what has tended to happen in ways that we'll explore is that the narrative of this mid-Tudor crisis has been presented as though it was something of an aberration between Henry's ch church and then Elizabeth's church, as though the Protestantism of Edward's reign was different somehow, and the Catholicism of Mary's reign was somehow, as, as historians put it, well into the 20th, late 20th century, doomed to failure. And all of that has led to a sort of myth um, of the way the English Reformation has been told that was very, very clearly articulated by Dermot McCulloch in an article about 30 years ago called The Myth of the English Reformation, which has seen seen the Anglicanism, as it later became, thing that we don't talk about in 16th century England, as a kind of different sort of thing from anything that was going on in these mid-decades of the 16th century. So those are some of the themes that we'll look at as we make our way through just 10 years of change. So here we have Edward um, in a portrait that was painted in 19 in um, 15, 1547 when he was nine 
um, and very much a portrait in which he's modelled on the sort of pose that we see um, and portraits of Henry VIII in that Holbein cartoon that we looked at last week. Very similar sort of um, presentation. And when Edward came to the throne, it was said that at his coronation, Thomas Cranmer said this. Your Majesty is God's vicegerent and Christ's vicar within your own dominions. And to see with your predecessor Josiah, God truly worshipped, and idolatry destroyed, the tyranny of the bishops of Rome banished from your subjects and images removed. Now, until about 20 years ago, people genuinely, it, it was assumed that was um, Cranmer's sermon at Edward's coronation. It now looks like it was in fact a rather later forgery fabricated back. So that's very disappointing because it very clearly indicates the tenor of the Edwardian Reformation. Edward was identified with the Old Testament boy king, Josiah, sent to reform the worship of God's people, to bring down idolatry, to see images, um, images removed and the temple restored, temple worship restored. So whether or not Cranmer did say that, that was the emphasis of what happened at the beginning of the religious policy of Edward's reign. And so the very first thing that, the very first bit of religious legislation that was passed was that the chantries were dissolved in an act of 1548. Now, religious houses, monasteries, convents, abbeys had, as we know, been dissolved by Thomas Cromwell in the late 1530s. But the chantries had remained. Chantries were chapels or foundations that were set up specifically to say masses for the dead. And some of them were very significant churches, significant foundations with numbers of priests um, employed to sing masses on a, um, on a daily basis to pray for the souls of um, the founders and the benefactors. And very, very quickly, the chantries are dissolved. And alongside this goes a thoroughgoing iconoclastic um, project of religious reform. Churches were whitewashed. So if we think back to the first week, when we looked at that picture of the doom in Holy Trinity Carventry, that very rich, visually striking picture that would have hit you possibly not quite as beautifully as the one in Coventry, but as you went into just about any parish church in England, up until the early 16th century, you would have seen rich visual painted imagery on the walls of the last judgment of the life of Christ, of the lives of the saints, often of the Virgin Mary, all kinds of things. The whitewash covered it all over. Now, the fact that most of it was whitewashed means that quite a lot of it survived in various places. And so quite often paintings have been uncovered in the course of later restoration. But it's hard for us now to imagine what that must have felt like in the mid 16th century. What that must have seemed like as your church went from a colourful place with stories, with images, with things that you recognised to being essentially whitewashed. Statues came down, the statues had stayed there, the statues came down. Um, many and many of the candles and lights that had burned in um, parish churches were removed. And likewise, in many places, stained glass windows were destroyed. That went even further than the Reformation in Zurich, which um, where even Zwingli said, nobody would be so stupid as to worship a stained glass window. We don't need to worry about stained glass. Edward's church, all the imagery and color was supposed to go. So that was the kind of outset of Edward's Reformation. And then very quickly, it became clear what the 
the legislative, the religious, the project was for the Edwardian Church. On, 50, on Whit Sunday in 1549, the first version of the Book of Common Prayer, the first English prayer book, was authorised for use in English parish churches. And it was the form of common prayer, um, the Book of the, form of, of the Common Prayer and Administration of the Sacraments and Other Rites and Ceremonies of the Church after the use of the Church of England. Um, you can't see it very well. This is this is the Parker Society reproduction of the the title page from the um, Parker Society were nineteenth century um, publishers, but there we were um, from uh, fifteen forty nine Whit Sunday. The parish church is in England. You were supposed to worship in English. Now, this was broadly. Um, broadly acquiesced to. People, people did adopt the new prayer book. And Eamon Duffy, writing particularly but specifically about the burial service, comments that hindsight and the fact that the second prayer book, of which I'll say more in a moment, was far more openly Protestant in character, means that it's hard for us now to realise just what a change that new liturgy represented. But it was extraordinary for people who were basically used to the traditional Latin mass, albeit with some tweaks in the canon about whether you prayed for the Pope or indeed the king as head of the church, things like that, um, which most people wouldn't have heard. The effect of this religious change, of this liturgical change, now mandated, imposed by Parliament, was extraordinary. And in the summer of 1549, there were religiously inspired rebellions, both in the southwest and in East Anglia. Um, and it's to the, the rebellion that happened in Cornwall and Devon that are particularly turn. It's usually referred to as the Prayer Book Rebellion. And what happened was rebels gathered and started to, to march, they, you know, um, and they raised their list of demands. Now, the demands of the rebels um, were in some ways quite, quite in keeping with all the things that Tudor rebels always um, got concerned about, things like the price of wool and the price of grain and local taxes and things. But more specifically, more importantly, they wanted the Latin mass as they were accustomed to. They wanted the priest dressed in his traditional vestments with all the accoutrements of traditional religion. This was religiously inspired rebellion in favor of traditional religious practice. And key to their demands was that they did not want to worship in English, which was to them a foreign tongue because the people of Cornwall in the mid 16th century mostly didn't speak English. They were accustomed to worship in Latin, whether or not they understood it, but they certainly didn't want this worship in English. Now, Cranmer was particularly unsympathetic about that demand, but the rebellion was brutally, brutally suppressed. Um, and on the, on the picture, the picture there is, um, it's a modern memorial that's on, um, the wall of the Roman Catholic Church in St Ives, in Cornwall rather than St Ives in Cambridgeshire. And it's a memorial to the prayer book rebels of the Western Rising. Um, and the priest, the priests who were involved with the re um, rebellion were hanged from their church towers in their Eucharistic vestments with their beads and sacring bells as a really visible visual example of just what was suppressed with the um, suppression of the Western Rebellion. It's important to bear in mind as we just think briefly about that rebellion, that there had already been a brutally suppressed rebellion from the West Country under the Tudors um, in 1497. So just about within living memory, 
So people knew the risks they were taking when they went into rebellion against the Tudor state. And they did that in defence of the traditional church, in defence of the old religion. What happened in East Anglia was rather different. There were rebels that gathered on Mousehold Heath, which was then outside Norwich, is now part of Norwich. And that was a rebellion which was inspired instead by an evangelical Protestant sensibility that thought that this, this reformation wasn't going far enough, fast enough. And that rebellion was also brutally suppressed, not because the Edwardian regime necessarily disagreed, but as a very clear indication of the power of the Tudor state and that this would happen at government pace. This wasn't going to be allowed to become popular movement in the way that had, say, happened in various places on the continent earlier. It wasn't going to get out of control. And that's something that when we come to look at Elizabeth, we will see again the, the emphasis on the way in which reformation will happen at the pace and timing that the that the government, specifically the crown, says. So 1549 sees this massive change in what is supposed to happen in the parish churches of England. People will now worship in English in a book that is broadly Protestant. But what happens is that people greatly disliked that it wasn't Protestant enough. Specifically, some, um, come to the next slide, um, some of the more international flavors of the Edwardian church. And in 1552, Cranmer's second prayer book is issued for public worship. So this is change happening at a remarkable speed. We've gone from a conservative church at the end of 1547, seeing the chantries dissolved, the parish churches of England transformed, an English prayer book introduced, rebellion both in favour of the Reformation and against it, and then again, very quickly, another English prayer book. And the 1552 prayer book, and indeed the 1552 articles of religion, the 42 articles, um, which, are, which are Cranmer's work, indicate something very clear about the flavour of the Edwardian church. So one of the things that has happened, if we think back to that first week and that map that we had of Europe, um, and the map we had of the Holy Roman Emp Empire, and just thinking about England in the political context of Europe, one of the things that ha that's happened is that the Lutheran League of Princes, the Schmalkaldic League, has been defeated by Charles V and a new religious settlement has been imposed on the Holy Roman Empire. And then in 1549, the various Swiss churches have agreed to a thing um, which is generally known as the Consensus Tigurinus, um, an agreement on broadly on Eucharistic doctrine between the different Swiss churches, which is basically an agreement, to an agreement to disagree. It's a recognition that they don't all think the same thing about the Eucharist, but that they're going to work together and not fight each other because they're going to fight other people. But one of the things that happens as a result of the political and religious situation in Europe is that England assumes a different place in the character of reformed Europe. So there's a narrative and a narrative that McCulloch in that myth of the English Reformation article describes, which sees the English Reformation as its own thing, as separate and special and different from what was going on in Europe. That is absolutely not what we're seeing 
when we look at the middle of Edward's reign and Edward's church. This is an international look, church that's looking primarily at the reformed Protestant churches of Switzerland, of Central Europe, to, so to Strasbourg um, and to the Swiss cantons, though with a, a significant eye to the Lutheranism of the Holy Roman Empire. And one of the things that Cranmer does is to bring across to England international superstar reformed theologians, particularly Martin Butzer, who had been key to, the key driver of the Reformation in Strasbourg, and Peter Marta Vermigli. Now, Peter Marta Vermigli is a very interesting character, and I'll try not to get distracted by, but um, he had been a leading Catholic reformer in Italy, and then had gone to Switzerland, had defected to the Reformation in 1542, um, and he comes, he comes to um, England and becomes Regis Professor of Divinity in Oxford, and a key, um, a, a key defender of the Edwardian Protestant Church. Now, Marta and Butzer also, and also um, a former Capuchin friar who'd also gone to, um, gone over to the Reformation in 1542 called Bernardino Aquino, who ends up as a kind of radical back um, in, in Central Europe. But they all become key figures in the way that the Edwardian Church of England develops and specifically in Butzer and Marta's case, in that development from the 1549, quite conservative, though very definitely Protestant English prayer book, to the 1552 prayer book. Martin Butzer wrote a thing called the Censura, in which he goes through the prayer book, um, the 1549 prayer book, and outlines all the things he doesn't like about it all the things that he thinks are popish and superstitious. And did you really mean to say that, Cranmer? Um, particularly, he objects to um, he objects to the fact that the water is blessed in the baptism service. He isn't at all keen on um, private baptism, and that becomes a continually controversial subject in um, the Elizabethan church as well. He doesn't like at all the burial service and he doesn't, doesn't much care for aspects of the communion service either. Now we've got Butzer's censura. We know what he said about the 1549 prayer book. We know that Peter Martyr wrote a kind of companion critique. We don't seem to have it. It doesn't, nobody seems to know what happened to it. But when the 1552 prayer book was produced, it has, there, there's clear evidence that Cram has taken on board the, some of the comments and criticisms that Butzer makes in his censura. So we can see very clearly direct international Protestant influence on the way the Reformation in England develops. Similarly, in the Oxford um, in Oxford in 1549, there are these stage debates about Eucharistic theology, and it's Peter Martyr who's out defending um, the Protestant position. Meanwhile, back in Europe, the, Cal the Council of Trent, the Counter-Reformation Counter um, Catholic Reform Council is underway. And there's evidence too that Cranmer was putting together plans, writing internationally to, to assemble a kind of Protestant equivalent council um, as an answer to the Council of Trent. Now that doesn't come about for a number of different reasons, but that's the flavor. That's the emphasis of the Edwardian church. And as well, something that starts to develop under Edward and continues and is really significant for parts of Elizabeth's reign is the presence of stranger churches in, in London. Um, so 
Protestant exiles from the continent, seeking refuge in London, worshipping together, gathering, um, often in former monastic buildings, and worshipping not according to the Church of England or its religious settlement, um, but very, very definitely in the heart of London as reformed Protestant congregations. And they become very influential, not least on the way some of Puritan moves for reform develop later. And when you start getting under Elizabeth, English stranger churches abroad, people who won't conform to the Elizabethan settlement, you get a kind of reverse movement. So that's the sort of flavour of the church we're looking at. Now, Eamon Duffy, who is not at all sympathetic to um, the to the, the um, to Edward's Reformation, describes iconoclasm as the central sacrament of the reform. He is very clear that the effect of Edward's Reformation is more or less entirely destructive destructive physically, destructive socially in terms of what it sweeps away. And, you know, that, that, that's a judgment call and that's a, that, that's a question of, you know, your, your perspective, how you look at something. But there is something very definitely revolutionary about what's going on in Edward's church. It isn't... Um, by any means, in the same key, the same tenor as what has been happening under Henry. And then it all comes to a shuddering halt because of Edward's early death. And as I say, later historians have often tended to see it as a sort of a bit of an aberration. When we come to look at um, in a fortnight's time, Elizabeth's religious settlement, what we'll see is what McCulloch describes as a kind of fossilization of the high watermark of Edward's reform. So what happens in 1559 is that Elizabeth kind of freezes the church at the point it was in 15, the autumn of 1552. And so you get all the stuff of the Edwardian Reformation, the liturgy, the articles of religion, um, all of that kind of thing, but without any of the, the forward momentum, the, dy um, the dynamism that had so characterised Edward's short reign. And we'll come, we'll come to look at that, but there's something very interesting going on there about how that then shapes and provides a structure in which something quite different comes to emerge in the early 17th century. So what sort of church was Edward's Church of England? It's undoubtedly completely a Protestant flavour of church. And it's a reformed Protestant church. Nothing could be clearer than, that, than, that, than the communion service of 1552 in making that clear. So in the 1549 communion service, key example, when uh, the words of administration, um, as the bread is administered, the body of Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Stop. In 1552, what you get instead is Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. Now, if you happen to spend much time worshipping according to the Book of Common Prayer now, you'll know that the full version of the words of administration is both halves of that. Now, that's a 1559 combination that's carried through in the 1662 prayer book. But in 1549, it says, you know, the body of Christ, which was given for thee. In 1552, it says, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee. It's quite a different thing going on. And the, and the prayer book, 
the two prayer books are full of examples like that. We could elaborate them, we could look at them later. But as I say, it all comes to a shuddering halt. And in 1553, um, oh, sorry, my computer's frozen. The, there is more religious change. So the first thing that happens on Edward's death is that there is an attempted Protestant coup. Lady Jane Grey is put on the throne, um, slightly tenuous, but not the most tenuous claim to the throne seen in early modern England. And it, she lasts nine days. What happens is that the succession as outlined in Henry VIII's will is upheld. And that is really significant. If we think back to all that instability of the 15th century, all that dynastic conflict, basically what is said is we don't want to go there again. We want stability. And so Mary, the first child of Henry VIII, daughter of Catherine of Aragon, who at various points in the course of her life has been legitimate, illegitimate, the heir to the throne, written out of the succession, finds herself as queen. And if we think of this way the story of Edward's reign has been told as a bit of a kind of, um, you know, rush of blood to the head aberration in the story of a kind of, you know, orderly, sensible English Protestantism, the story of Mary's reign has been told extraordinarily differently. Um, as recently as A.G. Dickens, he wrote, he described um, Ma the Marian church and Mary herself as the prisoner of a sorrowful past. Mary's reign was seen in most English historiography as entirely retrograde and um, regressive, um, foreign somehow, something quite interesting going on there, and doomed to failure. There's very little, um, had been very little sense of the positive aspects of what was going on under the Marian regime. And again, because it was so short lived, it was quite easy to write it out as it was never going to work, it was always going to fail. There's nothing inevitable about the failure of Mary's religious policy at all. But what happens is this. So Duffy describing, describing Dickens' account of the English Reformation notes that Dickens devotes 29 pages of what is a very substantial book to Mary's reign. So only 29 pages of which six of them discuss adverse public reaction to aspects of Mary's rule, particularly the marriage she makes to Philip II of Spain. Eight pages to Protestant martyrs, so that's 14 pages. Six pages to Protestant minorities who continued to practice. So that's 20 pages of 29 are all about adverse reaction or opposition to Mary's reign. And often, often in the historiography, um, Mary's reign is described as the Marian reaction. It's seen as reactive. It's seen as entirely in opposition to what's gone on under Edward. Now, in a sense, it was, but it can equally well be described, I think, as the Marian restoration. I'll come to it in, in a minute, but Duffy has done some even more interesting revisionist revisionist work um, with that. But the thing that everybody remembers about Mary's church is the ways in which it was a persecuting church. And partly that is because of what happens under Elizabeth. So in 1563, the first version of Fox's Book of Martyrs is published and it goes through multiple successive editions 
and um, each subsequent ed edition gets bigger and bigger and more elaborate. So it had, starts off as quite a small book. It ends up as an enormous book. But Fox's Book of Martyrs, almost unknown today, was hugely influential in the ways in which English Protestant sense of history and national identity, national Protestant identity, were formed from the 16th century. And it was very widely read in, into the 19th century. And it, what Fox does is what Protestant historians do all through the early part of the Reformation, which is kind of try and create a sort of Protestant genealogy to answer a question of, well, where was your church before Luther showed up? And so what they do is they go through everybody who's ever been persecuted by the Catholic Church, and they sort of lump them all together as... Um, as, you know, um, bedfellows, as, as fellow um, torchbearers of true religion. So you end up with some very interesting combinations of people. But what Fox does particularly is tell the stories of the Marian martyrs um, and particularly dramatises the deaths of the, the Oxford martyrs, so-called, of Ridley and Latimer in 1555, and then Thomas Cranmer in 1556. The, um, the image that you've got in front of you there is the woodcut of the burning of Thomas Cranmer um, from the first edition. And Cranmer was said to have um, put the hand with which he had recanted his, his Protestant faith into the flames first. And that's what you can see happening, happening there in front of you. Um, but the fact remains that in about two years, because the burnings really started from 1555, more than 280 Protestants were burned um, in Marian England, which is a huge scale of persecution, even by the standards of the religious violence of mid 16th century Europe. It's really significant. And if anybody can remember 1066 and all that, you know, it describes Mary as Bloody Mary, who dies with callus engraved on her heart, um, alluding to the loss of Calais, the last French dominion of um, the English crown. But that, that episode in later historiography comes to provide the sort of evidence that fed into the, the anti-Catholicism that widespread until really comparatively recently in English political and historic or thinking that sees, um, that, that saw the Catholic Church as, as foreign. And that's, far, that's certainly exacerbated by um, the fact of Mary's marriage to Philip II of Spain. Um, that sees it as a persecuting church and a repressive church. And that's all fed further by the fact that in, in light of this persecution, a huge number of more committed Protestants went into exile on the continent, particularly to um, Frankfurt am Main and to Switzerland. And that comes to have a significant effect on Elizabeth's church, because as these exiles return, having had a very different religious experience abroad, exposure to very different shapes of church and forms of worship, they want to bring that all into a kind of purified Protestant Church of England. And as we'll see when we come to the next, next session, that doesn't always sit well with the people who, through, um, through Mary's reign, including Elizabeth herself, have broadly conformed and been, you know, accommodated themselves one way or another to the um, restoration of Catholicism. The way that the Marian persecutions have been told has become quite an interesting um, case study in how people look at the history of the mid 16th century. So Duffy, in the bit that I referred to before, which was from the stripping of the altars, 
um, argued that a convincing history of the Marian church had yet to be written, which was true in 1992. In 2009, he published this, which we'll come to on another slide, which is called Fires of Faith, Catholic England under Mary Tudor, in which he attempted um, to write that persuasive and constructive history of the Marian church. And in lots of ways, he does. But one of the things he argues in it is that the burnings and the scale of the burnings was sort of inevitable in the context of the 16th century and of what was developing, what was growing as the counter or Catholic reformation. I think, I mean, for me, the arguments about the flavor of the of the Marian church and Marian church policy, which come to briefly in a moment, that is quite persuasive. But it, this raises questions for me about how we write some of our history and how, you know, what what has to to what extent you have to revise clearly bad things that happened and how far it's legitimate or feasible to make moral judgments in order to make a case. So it seems to me that in the, in the Fires of Faith book, in order to make the case for some good things happening in the Marian church, he needs to underplay the scale of the persecution that that church um, conducted in a way that I'm not sure actually ultimately helps his case very much. But if you read it for yourselves, you can, you can make your own judgments about that. There is a question about how far the Marian church was reactionary, was just trying to reverse the Reformation, and how far what, what Mary does, or Mary and her church does, is to invent the Counter-Reformation. Now here we've got Reginald Poole, who um, was pretty closely related to the English throne. Um, Henry had, through much of his reign, spent quite a lot of time worrying greatly about what Reginald Poole was up to on the continent, thought he was busy plotting against him, planning to overthrow him, and there was a point in the 1530s where Poole looked like a, you know, a realistic candidate should there be any attempt to depose Henry in favour of a Catholic succession. Now, Poole was made a cardinal in 1539. And Reginald Poole is very interesting because he had been much involved in a Catholic reform movement in the 1520s and 30s that is broadly known as the Spirituali. And the Spirituali um, were, were Catholic reformers, humanists. Um, they were, it was, an, it was a pretty elite group. It included Michelangelo. It included the Potus Vittoria Colonna um, and a Venetian card nobleman um, called Gasparo Contarini various people, and it included Peter Martin of Vermigli. And Poole comes very close in 1549 to being elected Pope. In 1539, rather, 1539, to being elected Pope. And had he been elected Pope, it is entirely possible that some of the Catholic Reformation in Europe might have happened a bit differently. Anyway. Mary makes him her Archbishop of Canterbury and Paul arrives and together with Bishop Bonner, who was the Bishop of London, and particularly Nicholas Harpsfield, who was one of Bonner's archdeacons, there is a significant attempt at Catholic re-education. So England has, um, in 1555, um, gone back and under Roman allegiance. There are attempts to refound the religious houses. They don't go terribly well initially. And it's hard to know whether 
given longer it would have been more successful, or whether the extent of the alienation of the monastic lands to the nobility and gentry of England had been such that it would have been a major, major work simply to re-endow the religious houses. But there is a significant effort at Catholic re-education. Um, Bishop Barner writes, um, a, 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 what is by the standards of the 16th century, um, in which there's an awful lot of kind of catechetical and um, introductions to theology written for all sorts of arguments. He writes a superb little book called The Profitable and Necessary Doctrine, which is clear and um, approachable, and a set of homilies. And the homilies become um, influential um, on the 1563 Protestant homilies. They're a response basically to Cranmer's 1547 homilies. And from 1556, parish priests were all required to preach from Bonner's Book of Homilies. In much of England, the um, return to the Catholic past was broadly welcomed. Very, very quickly, people um, suddenly managed to find their Eucharistic vessels and vestments and things that had all been put away somewhere um, during Edward's reign. Um, people started broadly to um, return to the Latin Mass, some of which leads one to suspect that in lots of places they'd never really left it. Um, and there had been there are complaints later in Elizabeth's reign, but there had been complaints um, under Edward too about priests counterfeiting the mass. So, you know, making the prayer book service look very like the mass. But that it isn't the same. I mean, the church buildings have changed as we've seen. You've got whitewash. You've lost a lot of the richness of the imagery. And so what happens is an in, is a narrowing under Mary of devotional focus. So in most parish churches, what goes back up again is the rood, so the crucifix with Mary and John standing at the foot of the cross. Um, and so whereas in the pre-Reformation churches, you would have had lots and lots of pictures of saints, and lots of different images of Mary particularly. You end up with, in most places, the only visual of Mary being Mary weeping at the foot of the cross. And that's entirely in, in the flavour of um, the sort of wider European Catholic movements that tend to focus, particularly from the 1550s onwards, on the Passion of Christ, and parishes are required, if they don't have a pax, to acquire a pax with a crucifix on it. So that's not, so there's a, there's a Catholic response to the emphases of Protestantism on Christ and his Passion and the saving work of the Passion that, that really does discipline and narrow the popular devotional range of the late medieval church. And that happens all across Europe and it happens in Mary's England. And who knows what would have happened if in 1558, Mary had not also died. And Mary and Poole die on the same day in November of 1558. Mary has been married to Philip II of Spain she has no heir. She has had various um, what historians have variously described as phantom pregnancy. She clearly had some sort of physical problem whereby um, at various points people thought she was pregnant, but she wasn't. And so she, she too dies without an heir. And her heir is her younger half-sister, Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth can never, never be a Catholic queen in the sense that Mary had been. But again, there is no obvious certainty about what will happen to the religious policy of England on Elizabeth's succession. 
Elizabeth, so far as the Roman Catholic Church was concerned, was illegitimate, so couldn't succeed anyway. But according to Henry's will, she was not. And again, what we see is an emphasis on the continuity of the Tudor succession. So in 10 years, in those 10 years between the death of Henry and then the accession of Elizabeth, we see a religious pendulum swing remarkably. We see all the, the Protestant sensibilities and moves to reform that have been pent up in the latter years of Henry's reign, let loose and um, what Dem McCulloch describes as Tudor church militant, a Protestant um, international forward-looking, distinctly reformed reformation underway under Edward. I think it's reasonable to suppose that had Edward lived, we would have ended up with a church that would look far more like the churches of Switzerland or Scotland or um, Netherlands than anything that would recognise as the Church of England today. Equally, had Mary lived longer and there been longer for her counter-reformation really to take root and to do that um, Catholic reconversion that we see start to see happening across parts of Europe from the late 16th century. There's no reason to suppose that her counter-reformation would inevitably have failed. So when we write the history of the English Reformation, what we tend to write, like when you write any history, is from beyond the next thing, beyond the next chapter. What we see in the middle of the 16th century might be crisis, might be dramatic revolution and counter-revolution, or it might be two distinct possibilities, two possible futures for religion in England had not people died quite when they did. So next week, we'll, well, no, not next week, week after next, we'll go on to look at what happens in the very long reign of Elizabeth I, in which she builds a Protestant country. And so further reading, two big books that you've seen before, um, The Stripping of the Altars and McCulloch's Cranmer book, and two little books, Duffy's Fires of Faith, Catholic England under Mary Tudor, and McCulloch's Tudor Church Militant, Edward VI and the Protestant Reformation. When the Tudor Church Militant book was, was um, published in the States, it was published as the Boy King, um, England under Edward VI or something. But I, I, I think Tudor Church Militant's a brilliant title. So thank you. And questions, comments, things to pick up on. I've, I'm aware that I didn't stop between the reigns. I just kept talking. So so anything you want to pick up on, now is your moment. David, do yes, you get your hand up? Yeah, I've got, yeah, um, yeah. I've got a couple of questions. One to be going on with, then I'll let somebody else have a go. Um, Edward was nine when he came to the throne. Yeah. So there must be a sense that it wasn't really him driving what happened over the next five years. So who was driving it? And to what extent uh, was Edward personally invested in the process of reformation that took place? Hmm. So initially, obviously, yes, he was nine. Um, I think it's worth noting that people understood adulthood as starting earlier mm -hmm. in the 16th century than we do now, but certainly not at nine years old. Um, and so initially the um in initially the the religious and indeed all policy was being being driven by Cranmer and by um Largely Edward Seymour relatives, um, Somerset and Northumberland. Um, that all comes to grief a bit as a result of the um, the rebellions. But Edward had 
very had very clearly been having a humanist Protestant education, is having a humanist Protestant education. Um, there's been some quite interesting work done on Edward's education. And there's a rather precocious little essay um, that he writes when he's, he's about 10 called, you know, why the Pope is a very bad man who must not be trusted sort of thing. So clearly his education has all been mm -hmm. um, decidedly evangelical in flavour. And he's clearly decidedly invested in, in what is happening. And increasingly, as the rain goes on, more invested mm -hmm. in it. But the religious policy of the early part of the rain, particularly, is largely driven by Cranmer. And so if we think back to last week and Henry, one can't help wonder how much of it he's been sitting there thinking about, really, mm -hmm. for quite some time. And, you know, is almost ready to press go um, yeah. with some of it. I've certainly been working on some English liturgy um, and probably also on drafts of the articles quite early on. And he's certainly been building the connections with the Reformed, with Protestant theologians on the continent since the 1520s. So, so I think most of that's to Cranmer. Thank you. Any more for any more, otherwise David can have his second second question. Uh, I think it's over to you again, David. Okay. Uh, yeah, the other question, you were talking about Eamon Duffy uh, mm. suggesting that the Marian persecution was uh, inevitable. Um, mm. Was that in the sense that if there's a major religious U-turn, there is bound to be collateral damage? Or was he thinking of something else when he described it as inevitable? I think his view, and I'm, you know, um, trying to be fair, mm -hmm. I think his view is that it's not particularly bad in the context of the 16th century, mm -hmm. that it's sort of legitimate policy. In, you know, is in the context the of the 1950s. That, is that in the sense that everybody did it? Yeah, pretty much, that people mm. persecuted one another and, you know, the Catholic Church burned heretics and... And, I mean, the Protestants weren't averse to burning people occasionally. Weren't averse to burning people occasionally, but on the whole, I mean, the only person burned, you know, the, the only person who's... Um, burned as a heretic in Calvin's Geneva mm. is Michael Servetus, um, mm. who... Anabaptist? Um, Anti-Trinitarian. Oh, right. Mm. Um, I mean, people were particularly unpleasant to Anabaptists and sort of drowned them and things yeah. um, in Germany. Um, and were very, very... There was a sort of reds under the bed feeling about Anabaptists mm. in... Um, particularly in Henrich in England, well, well, there just weren't any, you know, mm. there just weren't any in England then. Um, but the, um, there was a sort of, yeah, um, breads under the bad feeling about it. Mm. Um, but on the whole, um, I mean, there are some, you know, um, Tyndall and... Bilney and various people, you know, there are there are odd people, as in occasional people, um, burned for heresy under um, the Tudors other than Mary. But mm. on the whole, in Protestant Europe, people aren't. Mm. So and, it was more a Roman Catholic response. Yeah, um, and when... Certainly under Elizabeth, when Catholic clergy are executed very, you know, very gruesomely mm -hmm. and very cruelly, it's as traitors, not as heretics. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's something quite interesting going on. And I think that part of it is because, because the Protestants know that they're always being accused of being heretics. Mm -hmm. They're quite chary about persecuting other people for heresy. Mm. 
Right. Yeah. On the whole, even if they think they are. Mm -hmm. Right. So what Eamon Duffy is offering is perhaps an explanation rather, think, than, a, rather than a defence. Yes, yes, certainly. I think, But I think he's, he's part, I mean, I think he very much wants to... Uh, wants to tell a credible story of um, Mary's Mary's reign and Mary's church in a way that shifts it from the the sort of A. G. Dickens type narrative that sees it all as bad, bloody, foreign, and failed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more for any more? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course, Mayor Peter. Hello. Um, during Mary's reign, 1553 mm. to 1558, mm. uh, what about the 1552 prayer books? And was there a covert sort of situation where they were actually still being followed? Certainly in some places. Certainly in parts of, in some of, some of London. Um, in some places, they probably never got round really to figuring out that the 1552 prayer book was different from the 1549 prayer book. Um, in some places, they probably never really stopped. I mean, everybody had to have a copy of the prayer book. Mm. Uh, some of it, it's really hard to know just how much um, how much they were actually properly used. Um, but I mean, looking at the speed with which at the beginning of Mary's reign, lots of people went back to traditional Eucharistic practice and looking at the persistence in particularly in parts of the city of London, of um, Protestant practice, it would seem to me likely that in some parishes, um, basically people continued to use the 52 prayer book. Some places they basically continued to use the 49 prayer book. And in some places they were very, very happy to go back to the Latin mass or certainly some Henrician version of it. Um, I think it's really hard to know, except when we have direct accounts or where people are prosecuted for what they were or weren't doing, exactly what was going on in parish churches. Um, and I think in the midst of, I mean, 10 years isn't very long. And the just the sheer rate of change must have been so frightening and disorienting for people. Um, but I suspect that in lots of places, particularly where the clergy stayed the same, they just carried on with an accommodation. Um, certainly people still had the books, didn't get rid of them on the whole, because they come back again at the beginning of Elizabeth. Yeah. And they were expensive to buy as well. I think that's another thing that we forget. Um, even cheap print in the 16th century was a comparatively significant expenditure for most parish churches. Um, so, and in lots of places, more or less the only person who'd been able to read them confidently would have been the priest. Yeah, I think that might be. Yeah. Place. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming for supper. <laughs> but thank you. Um, so next, next, that was a fabulous um, overview uh, of those um, two two um, reigns. Um, so there's a there's a week off next week, and we return on the. Um, just check the date, everyone. So eighth, eighth, I think. Sounds right, doesn't it? Um, the eighth of December. That's right, seven p.m. So when we'll move into Elizabeth's reign. So. Um, thank you so much, Hannah, as ever, from all of us. That was superb. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye, everyone. Bye.
Thank, Thank, you. Thank 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 you.